We're going to talk about Lorenzo Ghiberti. And we're going to start talking about the competition reliefs uh, for the north doors of the Baptistry of Florence. And this took place 1400 to 1401 is when the uh, competition reliefs were created. You remember that the Baptistry of Florence has three separate entrances. And in the 1330s, Andrea Pisano uh, created the uh, south doors of the baptistry, which had the life of John the Baptist. And now, in the early years of the 15th century, the Opera del Duomo, the works of the cathedral, the committee of the works of the cathedral, uh, decided that they were going to uh, commission an artist to create the north doors of the baptistry of Florence. At that time, they thought that they would uh, use the Old Testament as the subject. They later changed their minds and used the New Testament. So today, the North Doors are the uh, subject is the New Testament. But the competition reliefs are the sacrifice of Isaac, and we're going to talk about those. There were seven finalists, all Tuscan artists, and they submitted sample reliefs. Now, Presumably, the committee must have told them uh, what figures to put it in, as well as the subject, uh, because we have not only the three main figures of Abraham, Isaac, and the angel, but we also have sort of the extras of two servants and a donkey in both. And so here we're looking at two of the competition reliefs. They're the only two that survived. So presumably the other, the other five were melted down and the bronze reused for the uh, doors. Uh, bronze is very expensive, so it's interesting, it's curious that these were saved, and of course we don't know why. Uh, guess? Maybe there was a controversy about which one would be chosen, and they saved them to serve as evidence if anybody uh, objected to the choice, but that's just a guess. So here we are looking at Brunelleschi's and Ghiberti's uh, competition reliefs, both showing the sacrifice of Isaac. The story of Abraham and Isaac is a very important subject uh, in Christianity because it is believed that the sacrifice, sacrifice of Isaac is a prefiguration or a type for the crucifixion of Christ. The story of Abraham is that he believed that God wanted him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh, and in obedience to God, even though he didn't want to do it, uh, he took his son out and is prepared to sacrifice him, to kill him, uh, to, to send his son to God, in a sense, um, in order to uh, prove that God is before all for him. Well, God doesn't want him to sacrifice his son, and so he sends an angel which stops the sacrifice. And then there is a uh, sheep, a ram, in the, uh, caught in the bushes next to uh, the place where they are going to sacrifice Isaac, and they use that as the animal sacrifice instead. This, of course, is the time uh, when there are animal sacrifices, and evidently it's a transition from uh, human sacrifice to animal sacrifice. And here we're going to look a little closer, and you can see the difference here uh, in the figure of Isaac, particularly. Uh, the Ghiberti's Isaac is this classical, nude, uh, beautiful, ideal figure, uh, very gracefully posed in this uh, kind of curving arc, which you'll see throughout Ghiberti's work. Um, if I have to have one word to describe Ghiberti's style, it's going to be either elegant or graceful. Brunelleschi, however, is using uh, something that's what, much more uh, emotive or powerful, uh, even violent, uh, because we have the uh, figure of Isaac twisted around with these very angular forms as though he is resisting the knife. And uh, his father, Abraham, is just about to plunge the knife into his throat when he's, his arm is grabbed by the angel. As you can see with Ghiberti, there's still a little bit of time, a little bit of space. It's not uh, the, the, the imminent death. 
So first we're going to look right here at Brunelleschi's Sacrifice of Isaac. And you can see that it is, as we said, very dramatic, very violent. Uh, and it has what we call planar recession. If you look at the figures of the servants and the donkey, you'll notice the donkey is parallel to the picture plane. The servants seem to be about the only figures that actually bend toward us, uh, that they are shown uh, with some kind of foreshortening. Uh, but there seems to be a plane right there that's at the bottom of the hillside. And then there's another plane at the top, and you can see that the angel is coming in parallel to the picture plane. Uh, the ram's body is parallel to the picture plane. Isaac's body is turned, so it is parallel to the picture plane. And uh, Abraham, likewise, is in profile, uh, parallel to the picture plane. So uh, this is a way of showing depth. It makes perfect sense for Brunelleschi, too, because Brunelleschi, as an architect, used planes, his walls. Uh, we often talk about Brunelleschi's architecture as being very planar. We know that Brunelleschi was trained as a silversmith. But look at his technique. What you have is the flat background shape, the quatrilobe shape, this gothic shape that we saw Andrea Pisano using as well. But all of the figures are cast separately. And they're solid bronze, riveted to the back. So if you were to look at the back, you'd have a flat back. And so these are all separate pieces that he has cast. Keep that in mind, because it is relevant to the choice of artist. Now, there are, in both of these works of art, references to classical antiquity. Uh, what Brunelleschi has done is show you uh, the servants, as though they're examining their feet, uh, maybe taking a thorn out of their foot or uh, pebbles. Um, and this is a kind of direct quotation of a very famous classical statue that is in Rome, uh, the Spinario, or the boy taking a thorn from his foot. And he's, here we see the other figure, a slightly different pose, uh, but also leaning over. Ghiberti's figures are very different. Uh, the words that come to mind are things like elegant and graceful. And you'll notice, for example, that Abraham is a curving form, sort of a graceful arc. And Isaac leans back in the same direction, another arc. Uh, and also notice the swinging folds of the drapery. Even the hillside that here separates the uh, servants from what is going on with Abraham and Isaac uh, is a kind of rocky curve. You'll notice that there's a fair amount of foreshortening of figures or parts of figures uh, coming toward us. The angel, instead of coming sideways, uh, parallel to the picture of the plane, comes out as though he's coming from heaven and uh, the, the back is uh, being penetrated and, and he's uh, coming forward. The elbow of Abraham is raised up and it's, it's projecting out toward us. It's, it's shown in foreshortening. And even the head of the donkey, there's not quite as much emphasis on the donkey. The donkey has been covered up uh, with the, uh, other, the standing servant when we see from the back. But the donkey's head, instead of being parallel to the picture plane, uh, curves out toward us. So this gives a more spatial uh, feeling to it. One thing you should also notice is the uh, edge of the drapery the edge of Abraham's drapery. It seems to flutter in the breeze uh, and uh, forms a very graceful pattern. Your book calls Isaac the first truly ideal Renaissance nude. And think how small that is. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very small little piece, but it shows the classical ideal proportions. It's a graceful figure. It's a beautiful figure. And what you're seeing here with Renaissance art and with Ghiberti is elements of naturalism combined with idealism. And that is really a Renaissance way of representing forms. Now, Ghiberti's technique was finer than Brunelleschi's. It seems surprising. 
Ghiberti was trained as a painter. However, his stepfather was a bronze caster. So perhaps that's where he learned his bronze casting. And if you could look at the back of the relief, it would not be one flat piece. It would be indented. It would be hollowed out where the figures are. This was cast as one piece, except for the solid figure of Isaac, which was uh, added to it. And the figures are hollowed out. Now, this has several advantages. It means that the relief itself is less weighty. It, it literally weighs less. It's stronger because it's not all these little pieces. And it uses less bronze. Now, think about that for a minute. Bronze is very expensive. So if you're using less bronze, you're being more efficient with it, then that's a finer technique, and it also would be something that the committee would look for. It will cost less to create these doors, which are going to be very expensive. And in fact, if you start with the reliefs, it's, what, 24, 25 years that Guberti spends on the first doors from 1401 to 1425. Uh, these are on the north doors, his first doors. Uh, and then when he gets to uh, the second set of doors that he does, the east doors, that's 27 years, from 1425 to 1452. So uh, this is going to cost a lot. It's going to spend a lot of time and uh, a lot of material. So if they can save some money with the bronze, why not? So. I suspect that those two factors, the grace of the figures, and the more efficient use of bronze may have been some of the factors that the uh, committee uh, considered. Interestingly enough, it was not the committee of the Opera del Duomo that actually did the decision. They passed it on to the oldest and one of the most powerful guilds, which was the Guild of the Wool Merchants, the uh, refiners of imported wool. And they had a com committee, and they made the final decision. So here we see the north doors of the Baptistry of Florence. You can see you have seven rows and uh, four columns on the two, two doors. Uh, and it shows you what the different subjects are. By and large, uh, there are New Testament scenes with uh, four evangelists and four doctors of the church. And you can see that it's bronze, and then some of the figures are picked out with gold leaf. And gilding is what uh, they're picked out with gold leaf, which is what gilded bronze means. Now let's look at some of the figures. Uh, here you have the Annunciation. We're kind of looking up at it and then uh, a picture that's been taken so you can see it straight across. And some of the characteristics that we saw before with the sacrifice of Isaac, these curving graceful forms that uh, sort of form an arc. And in this case, the angel uh, seems to have be just about to land. His feet are not quite on the ground. He's got little clouds at his feet as he's flying in. It's this wonderful curving shape and then his arm makes another curving form toward the Virgin Mary. Uh, she sort of leans back uh, in a, a form that answers that uh, and uh, uh, they're almost sort of uh, sweeping together. There is a suggestion of architecture. She stands in a doorway and of course, that would have been one of the characteristic names of Mary, that she herself is, in a sense, the portal uh, into paradise because it is in her womb that the savior of the world uh, will, uh, will come into being, will be born. We also see the uh, small figure of God the Father in half length and foreshortened once again, coming in with sending the dove of the Holy Spirit. And you'll remember at the Annunciation, uh, Mary says, uh, when the angel, t the angel Gabriel tells her that she will bear uh, a child, and she says, how can this be? I know no man. And he says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And so the dove uh, is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
And here you see it's just a slightly different point of view when we're looking at the figure of Mary. Uh, her hand is raised. One of the first things the angel says is, fear not. Uh, so there's that slight, uh, let's say, apprehension perhaps in the figure. Ghiberti creates a beautiful flagellation. And I know that sounds contradictory because the flagellation would be horrible. It's when uh, Christ is whipped. And yet, look at this. You have the uh, and horizontal entablature going at the top and these slender uh, classicizing columns behind the figures as a kind of vertical rhythm. Uh, Christ in the center is this beautiful figure, uh, a classical ideal figure uh, with the weight on one foot, uh, the, other, the other foot flexed, and once again that curving form that you see. And then the, uh, the tormentors who are scourging him uh, form a kind of reverse parentheses, if you will, uh, on either side in a, a, a very uh, symmetrical composition. But uh, each form individually is very graceful. The same thing can be said uh, of the crucifixion. Uh, and in this case, as you can see, the figures of John and Mary uh, seated at the base of the cross just fit perfectly into the um, curving shapes of the uh, lobes of the, uh, the quattro lobe of the, the design. Uh, and then you see this curving form again with the angels and then with Christ's, cross, Christ's arms as they hang from the cross. So the main figure is being silhouetted there. Um, you have this detail of Mary, and of course, very melancholy, you know, resting her uh, head on her, on her hand. Um, you'll notice that in this case, the, the gold has pretty much flaked away. And yes, you'll see different photographs. Uh, sometimes they'll have been newly restored with new gold placed on them, and they'll be all nice and shiny. Uh, and other times the gold is flaking away. And sometimes in photographs it almost looks like a negative because uh, the high points is where the gold would, would flake off first. Uh, and so uh, they are actually the darker shape of the bronze is showing, for, showing through. Although Ghiberti spent most of his life working on the two sets of doors for the Baptistry of Florence, he also managed to do a few other sculptures. And he did several sculptures for Orsan Michele. Now, I need to explain what that is. As you can see, this is a very large three-story building, uh, and it is in Florence. And it was originally a grain market and grain storage. Uh, the lower level is converted into a church. And so you see those great arches uh, with all of the tracery in them and then uh, either doorways or completely filled in with kind of blind arcades. Um, those were originally open to the market. And so when they made it into a church, they uh, filled it in uh, with this uh, you know, beautiful cut work, this beautiful tracery. And as you see, against the walls, there are niches. And in each of these niches uh, was to be placed a statue of a saint. The guilds of Florence were each assigned a niche to decorate with the statue of saints, uh, often their patron saint. Now, when you're passing by, I guess you have more of the feeling of when you're passing by. Uh, you may not be looking up and seeing how tall that building is. It's where they would store the grain up above. Uh, but you can get the idea of uh, where you might be in relationship to these niches. Uh, so the, the niches would be just above your head. Uh, you know, a tall person, perhaps uh, the bottom of the head and the niche would be, uh, as you can see, uh, kind, of, kind of similar, <laughs> the placing. Uh, some of these figures are in bronze, which is more expensive. Uh, some of them are in um, some of them are in marble. From about 1405 to 1417, uh, Ghiberti created this statue in bronze of John the Baptist, San Giovanni Battista, an Italian. Um, Giovanni Battista was the patron saint of Florence. So this was a very important statue. It was also a very large statue. 
eight, over eight feet high, eight feet uh, four inches. And so it was an important technological feat uh, to create a, a statue of this size. Nothing like that had been done in this area uh, for centuries. So uh, it certainly shows his casting skills. This was commissioned by the Arte di Calamala. Now, Arte means guild, and this is the guild of the wool merchants or the refiners of uh, imported wool. And that was the oldest and one of the wealthiest guilds in Florence. So they could afford bronze and they had the honor of uh, commissioning the, the, the patron saint of Florence. You'll remember the swinging folds of the draperies of, of Abraham and uh, the uh, servant in the uh, competition relief. Well, here he's also using these swinging fo folds. Uh, they've been called sword blade draperies by uh, DeWald, who's one of the art historians. And he relates them to the kind of draperies that you might find in the international Gothic style or the late Gothic style. And so I brought in a Gothic virgin and child. I think it's Bohemian. I've been trying to look it up. Uh, but I found that it had some of these swinging draperies as well, so you can see. Uh, and they, they fall in graceful rhythmic patterns. Uh, the drapery is usually pulled up to one hip and then falls uh, in a kind of cascade uh, on both of these figures. Uh, I don't mean that Ghiberti ever saw that particular virgin and child. It was just uh, one that I had a picture of that I thought particularly showed this kind of uh, swinging drapery. Now, it's often said that this shows that Ghiberti still has, uh, that Ghiberti is still creating art that has uh, Gothic elements about it. He creates this uh, unity through linear rhythms and sort of these exaggerated curves and shapes. Hart disagrees with DeWald. He says that Ghiberti's linearity has been called Gothic, but nothing could be further from the truth, that these types of draperies were derived from classical antiquity. You know, it could be both. He could look at some classical drapery and uh, find swinging folds. And he could also look at Gothic art and see the rhythmic possibilities. So I'd, I'd say that the sword blade drapery probably is closer to uh, some kinds of Gothic art, but the graceful rhythms of both Gothic and classical art could have attracted Ghiberti. And that as he develops it, he moves more toward a more classical understanding of rhythmic draperies. Uh, and just think of things like the um, Annunciation of the North Doors of the Baptistry that we just saw uh, with this uh, you know, beautiful uh, figure of the Madonna. And then we will soon be seeing um, such figures as the Jacob relief in the East Doors of the Baptistry uh, in which there's a lot less pattern but still a uh, graceful movement to the drapery. We want to look at some of the details. Uh, it has uh, John the Baptist as a uh, saint with uh, gaunt cheeks and uh, very high cheekbones. Uh, he, of course, uh, went out into the desert, uh, lived on locusts and wild honey, uh, and uh, wore a goat skin. And so you see the good just a little bit of the goat skin uh, peeking through his mantle. And there's just these beautiful, um, graceful arabesques of curving forms, uh, which are very similar to the, uh, the curls of the beard. And uh, so he has this beautiful linearity uh, in his sculpture. And I thought this was interesting. I found this picture on the web, and it shows you what this looks like from below. And uh, the uh, drapery just seems to swing up, and the proportions uh, seem to correct themselves. And you'll find that this is true of the Renaissance artists. You're going to find this with uh, Nani de Banco, with uh, Donatello, uh, that they design their sculpture for the place. 
And a lot of times people come along and they get up on scaffolding and they take photographs straight on. But that's not how this was going to be viewed. Uh, so because we'd be seeing it from below, you know, he may seem to have a, a longer torso, but that's corrected when we look up at the image in the uh, niches. Ghiberti was also commissioned to create the bronze statue of St. Matthew. And this was done for the Arte di Cambio, which is the Bankers Guild. Uh, if you go to Florence uh, or anywhere in Italy, you will see signs up saying Cambio, which is where you can go and change your money. Uh, well, the Bankers Guild did, wanted to do some one-upmanship, I suppose, on the, uh, the Wool Merchants Guild. And so they specified that their statue had to be at least as high, as tall, as large as the, as the John the Baptist statue. And, and it's actually about six inches taller. Uh, it's eight foot ten inches. And it was done succeeding years uh, in 1419 to 23. As you can see, there's still elegance, but there's increased realism. You have the swinging folds, but they're not as what, sword blade. They're not as abstracted. Uh, and you have the weight on one leg. Uh, you can see one leg is flexed and it's pressing against the drapery as though there really is a body beneath the figure. And it's been suggested that that could be the influence of a work we'll, we'll see soon, uh, which is Donatello's St. Mark, which is shown in contrapposto, or uh, with the leg on one, in contrapposto with the weight on one leg. You can see the graceful hands uh, of the figure. And of course here, Matthew is holding up his gospel, the gospel of St. Matthew, the first book of the Christian New Testament. And here we're seeing Matthew from below, once again. Well, we're going to return to the Baptistry of Florence and talk about the East Doors. So for over 25 years, for about 27 years, Ghiberti worked on the East Doors to the Baptistry of Florence. Uh, this has a particular name that has been given to it by none other than Michelangelo. He called these doors the Porta della Paradisia, which we've translated as the Gates of Paradise, or the Doors of Paradise, or the Portals of Paradise. In other words, the entry into heaven. So he's saying that they are beautiful enough uh, to adorn heaven itself. Another possible interpretation, I guess a more theological one, of Michelangelo's statement was that uh, Christians believed that you had to be baptized in order to be saved, in order to enter heaven. So in that sense, it also uh, are the gates of paradise. They lead you into uh, uh, the baptistry to be baptized. Uh, he probably was thinking, though, of the beauty of these doors. You'll notice that the shape of the scenes is totally different. The quatrilobe shape was a very much a Gothic shape, and by 1425, that would have been hopelessly old-fashioned. Uh, these are approximately squares. They're not exactly squares. You see they're a little taller than they are wide. But they give the appearance, as you look at each scene, as though you're looking through a window frame. And this is the kind of phrase that Alberti would have used he would have, uh, when he wrote, uh, uh, when he was writing his book on painting. Uh, Alberti was uh, a humanist scholar and uh, an art theorist who wrote uh, a number of books, including three books on painting and another on sculpture and another on architecture. And his book on painting came out um, in the mid-1430s, uh, around 1435, first written in Latin and immediately translated into Italian. And uh, we often use some of the phrases from the book. And uh, one of the things is this idea of looking through a window into a world, an illusionistic world, uh, that the artist is trying to create something that appears to be uh, a reality. Now, as we said, 
the committee changed their minds. They decided for the north doors, instead of using Old Testament scenes, they would have New Testament scenes, which means that the last set of doors to be created, uh, the East Baptistry doors, the Gates of Paradise, are, of course, uh, Old Testament scenes. Uh, they are in gilded bronze, and here you can see they gilded the, uh, the entire scenes and uh, the sort of uh, framework with these different statuary between them. We're going to look closely at one of these works and then look at several others. Uh, this is the story of Jacob and Isaac. And it is the story of, of a dysfunctional family. This is when Isaac has become an old man and he's gone blind. But he has two sons uh, by his wife, uh, Rebecca. And they're two twin boys, although they are obviously fraternal twins. They have nothing in common, it seems. Esau was born just a few minutes before Jacob and says that when they came out of their mother's wombs, uh, Jacob was holding Esau's foot and the idea was that they were fighting together, even in the womb. Uh, so Esau is the oldest son. He is the favorite of his father. And as the oldest son, by uh, the rules of primogeniture, he will inherit all of his father's goods. Jacob's not very happy about that. And we'll see what he does. Now, one of the things about Esau is that he is an outdoorsman. He's a hunter. And uh, he will often bring back game and make a game stew or soup that his father really, really likes. And that will figure prominently in the story. We see a number of scenes. It's what's called simultaneous representation. Uh, if you look in right in the center, sort of the middle ground, uh, you'll see just uh, one figure uh, who seems to be striding forward and he's throwing his bow on the ground and uh, you can just barely see uh, uh, the figure of uh, Jacob behind the figure in the foreground. Well, this is probably the beginning of these really serious troubles between the brothers. Um, Esau comes back from hunting. He either hasn't caught anything or hasn't had time to fix any food. And he comes in and he's just he's been gone for days and he is so hungry. And he sees his brother making a bowl of soup. And he says, give me that soup. I'm just starving. And Jacob says to him, give me your birthright and I'll give you some soup. Well, his birthright is his inheritance. And what does Esau say? He says, what good does it do me if I starve to death? Give me the soup. And you say, how could he be so foolish? How could he possibly uh, exchange his birthright, all of his inheritance, for a plate of soup? Well, one of the questions that the medieval commentators, or uh, we call this exegists, when they uh, find additional meanings beyond the literal text in the Bible. And um, during the Middle Ages, they interpreted this scene as symbolic, that Esau became uh, the symbol of a worldly man who uh, only cares about things of this world and will sacrifice uh, the, the uh, things of the spiritual world for things of the physical world, which simply are just not as important. So the plate of soup stands for worldly goods, worldly uh, desires, and the uh, birthright stands for the spiritual realm, uh, things that are really important. One of the reasons they needed to uh, explain it away, too, is Jacob does not come across very well in this story. And yet, uh, as the story unfolds, he seems to be the hero. He seems to be favored by God. So there has to be you know, some reason for that. And so uh, they try to do it with symbolism. Now, one of the things you'll notice about this is that you have these grid lines on the ground uh, that uh, uh, seem to converge at a vanishing point. And you'll notice that the lines on the floor that seem to be uh, inlaid floor tiles uh, go back and they become closer and closer together. Well, this is the grid lines uh, that when you were figuring out how to do linear perspective, you would have to draw these grids and uh, figure them out mathematically. And in the 15th century, it almost seems like the artists are figuring out, we went to such work to do this, we might as well incorporate them into the painting. 
And so here we have grid lines on the ground, which are um, uh, representa representing the tiles or the floor uh, or the uh, stone on the floor. So Ghiberti here is using a linear perspective. He's also using a kind of uh, atmospheric perspective that you can do with sculpture. In other words, having high relief in the foreground. And some of these uh, figures are very, very high relief and then very shallow relief in the background, uh, which does give it a hazier quality as though it's, it's further away. You'll also notice that the architecture is classical. It's got rounded arches and pilasters as Roman art might have. It's quite simple though to sort of suggest that this is a long time ago, this is early in history. We also see that the uh, clothing, some of it seems to be contemporary. Uh, the two boys, uh, Esau and Jacob, are wearing these little tunics uh, that, uh, and uh, boots that could be contemporary uh, young men about town in Florence. Uh, but some of the other figures are wearing what I, I sometimes call uh, amorphous biblical robes or uh, draperies and robes that are inspired by classical art, uh, particularly those of the, the young women and, of course, of Jacob as well. Uh, the figures are idealized figures. They are beautiful. They are graceful. The young ladies in the lower left are these beautiful, uh, ideal figures. Uh, they're extras. They're the maidservants around the house. Uh, but he uses them to show this uh, grace and idealism uh, and, the, you know, the, the beauty of the human body. You have the one figure whose back is toward us, and you can see how the drapery curves around and uh, presses, and her body presses against the drapery, and it just leaves a very, very graceful effect. Uh, and uh, you have some of the swinging folds. Uh, the figure that's holding what seems to be laundry on her, sh on her head uh, is a very familiar type of pose in Renaissance art. We see it in painting, we see it in drawing, and we see it in sculpture. Uh, it's probably derived from a classical statue or a classical relief with the drapery that uh, uh, surges out, uh, the supposedly windblown drapery uh, in this kind of circular pattern. And uh, the dress that she's wearing with the high waist and the sort of poof over the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, stomach area is a, a classical uh, type of drapery that is it's found on um, some sarcophagi. Um, Donatello had a statue in this pose that, that no longer survives. It's called the Dovizia. And so it may be that it, has, that it is either directly from the Dovizia or um, from that and a classical model. And just uh, quickly, let's take a look at some of the other works of art. This is the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, various scenes from the Genesis story. In the lower left, uh, you see this figure of Adam uh, being uh, sort of pulled up by, uh, by God, uh, and he's, you know, he's giving him life. Uh, in the lower right, uh, he is... Uh, creating Eve, and she seems to almost float out of Adam's side uh, at the command of God. And then if you look uh, in the uh, background, or the, where you have this very shallow relief uh, just uh, above Adam, uh, you can see that there is the fall of man, uh, Adam and Eve partaking of the forbidden fruit, tempted by the serpent. And it also gives you a, an idea of how far in relief these foreground figures are. I mean, God the Father, uh, at the top part of him, is, all, is separated from the background. And you can see also that Adam's head uh, is separate. Uh, he's, he's almost a fully... Uh, He's almost a figure in the round, except he's not. He's, he's up against a background. And then to show a distant view, uh, as we said, some more atmospheric, you have the very shallow uh, figures in the background. And there's also, of course, the expulsion. 
um, when Adam and Eve are expelled or thrown out of, of Eden. And that's shown in a combination of high and low relief. You have the beautiful figure of Eve uh, and behind her Adam, and they are in, in high relief. Uh, and this archway that marks the uh, entrance or the exit in this case uh, into paradise, into Eden. And as you can see, the angel is sort of flying through and the angel is being sent by God, who here is in very, very low relief, uh, surrounded by a host of angels uh, as he is uh, expelling Adam and Eve. And then here we have the story of Abraham again. What changes have been made from, you know, what, 30 years perhaps? Maybe, maybe even more. Um, you can see that the story of Abraham and the East Doors is in this uh, rectilinear format, as we said, like a, a window into a world. It has several uh, events uh, in the story of Abraham. Uh, down in the lower right, uh, you see Abraham kneeling to three angels. And the Bible tells us that there were three messengers of God, which is what an angel is. There are uh, three men that come and uh, Abraham entertains them. He gives them food and drink. And uh, the, the phrase, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, uh, angel, the phrase entertaining angels unaware applies to the story of uh, Abraham. And uh, then the guests uh, reveal themselves as messengers of God. And they tell him that he will indeed have a child, that his wife, Sarah, who is 80 years old, will bear a child. Well, Sarah has been infertile all her life. She's tried to have a child. She hasn't succeeded. Uh, so she thinks that's probably not going to happen. She has a great deal of doubt about it. But of course, as we know, uh, it comes to pass that she bears Isaac. The other half of the scene shows the sacrifice of Isaac. And you see the same players that we saw before. Here we have the servants. Uh, and the donkey uh, down at the lower right. Uh, here the servants are sort of uh, just seated around uh, taking their leisure. They don't know what's going up on the top of the hill. Uh, and the donkey is shown from the rear. Renaissance artists love to show donkeys and horses from the rear because it shows because it shows their skill in foreshortening. Uh, and I have to admit, uh, he makes even the rear of a donkey and this uh, curving tail seem graceful. Uh, and then at the top of the hill, we see Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac uh, while the angel intervenes. Of course, this is in a very low relief. Uh, and the two scenes are divided by the landscape, by the, uh, the verticals of the trees of the rocky uh, mountainside which now seems more believable. And the whole scene, of course, uh, has not only two scenes, but seems much more space, spacious. There's much more air in the picture, if you will. 